I hope you're having a good day today. My name is Ralph Brewer, and I'm the Executive Director for Potter Children's Home in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I'm a guest on Life from Heaven today. I am looking forward to this, and I'm honored uh, to be a guest speaker on the program today. So I hope you're blessed uh, by this uh, presentation. You know, many children in our society uh, continue to suffer with no one to help them. Wish it wasn't that way, but it indicates that their history indicates that it has always been that way in one way or another. The story of Adam Walsh in 1981 caught most people's attention. Adam, many will remember, was abducted in a store in Florida, just a few feet from his mother. He was taken, kidnapped, and sadly, about two weeks later or so, parts of him were found in a canal. It's a horrible situation. Since that time, there have been many other children who've been abducted and killed. Megan Conka, a bunch of others. And so now we have Megan's Law for the highways and we have Code Adam for the stores. We, we sometimes ask ourselves, what is happening in our society today? Well, in Jeremiah's day, the prophet Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, Things were not good either. In fact, you could probably make the case that things were worse in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah didn't really like the message that he had been given to give, but God wanted him to give the message, so much so that God told him, Jeremiah, don't get married and don't have any children, not in this place. We see in Jeremiah chapter 16, the word of the Lord also came to me, that is Jeremiah, saying, You shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bear them, and their fathers who beget them in this land. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be lamented or buried. They will be as dung on the surface of the ground, and come to an end by sword and famine and their carcasses will become food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth. It's a sad situation. Children dying in the streets, laying there, and no one is mourning their death. No one is even burying them. They're left for the birds to pick apart. It's a terrible situation, and so God says, Jeremiah, don't get married and don't have any children. Well, through Jeremiah 16 and 17, there's a lot of talk of children and, and especially fathers. And in Jeremiah 17, we see Jeremiah telling the people that the children are learning lessons, but they're not learning lessons in books. They're learning it with an iron stylus and a diamond point. It says the sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus. With a diamond point, it is engraved upon the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. As they remember their children, so they remember their altars and their asherim. No, they weren't teaching the children through books or even through chalk and a chalkboard or a marker board. No, they were, they were teaching the children lessons by their example. And they were carving those lessons into the hearts of the children. They were doing it by their example. Because you see, the children saw what the parents considered to be important. There's an old song that we sometimes sing, tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Well, there are a lot of children in our country even today who are having far different lessons written on their hearts. Well, there's a special emphasis really all through the Bible about having compassion on children. Especially widows and orphans are mentioned numerous times in Scripture. God sees himself as the guardian of these people who have a need and who are not able to provide for themselves. And God says that we as his children, as his people, are to plead their case for them. <clears throat> I'd like to look at several verses from God's Word, and, and believe me, we don't have anywhere near the time to look at all of them. It would take us hours to really effectively look at all of the verses in the Bible 
that touch on this topic. But we do want to look at a few. From Deuteronomy chapter 10, we see, He, that is God, administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, we see, At the end of every third year you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year, and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates, Notice that he mentions the fatherless and the widow again. That they may come and eat and be satisfied. That the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, we find this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. That the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs. Again, it shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. God says you were vulnerable, you were abused, and I cared for you. And so you need to remember the less fortunate. These verses in Deuteronomy 24 have really been the, the impetus for another way that God's people can serve. At Potter Children's Home and, and in a number of, of, of homes like it, we have a change can program. And the, the concept is exactly the same as we see here in, here in Deuteronomy 24. People take a... a, a, a can and the concept is at the end of the day when you have a little bit of change left over in your pocket put it in the can it's just like those who look back and saw a little bit left in their fields and god said leave it for the widows and the orphans and so we get a good amount of support each year from people just throwing the leftover change that they have into a can and it's a real blessing to the children who live there. Well, it really doesn't take long to begin to see that there is a pattern <clears throat> along these lines in God's Word about what is important to Him. In, in Psalm 68, verse 5, we're told that God is a father to the fatherless. The, the Psalms are full of these kinds of con comments that God supports the widows and the fatherless. Besides Jeremiah, all of the prophets keep coming back to this concept. And the people often ignored it. In Amos 4, there was a, a, an account that was almost an insulting account, condemning the people for ignoring these ideas. In Zechariah chapter 7, we see, Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. And do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the stranger or the poor. And do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. <clears throat> but they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears from hearing. <clears throat> The people refused to pay attention to God, and so they were scattered, and God said He made their land desolate. Ezekiel, Isaiah, all of the prophets touch on this specific topic here. Isaiah begins his prophecy in, in Isaiah chapter 1, comparing those who neglect widows and the fatherless to the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, many, many other scriptures could be given. As I said, we don't have time to look at anywhere near all of them, but someone has counted that the Hebrew word yatham, and I believe we have a slide for this, that that Hebrew word, which is translated orphan or fatherless, appears connected to the word widow 44 times in the Old Testament. The concept is repeated again and again and again. And it emphasizes 
at least one very important thing that God's people should be involved in. Well, there are many scriptures even in the New Testament because the New Testament continues the theme. What we call the golden rule from Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, Jesus said, in everything, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Well, if you were unable to provide for yourself, what would you want people to do? You would want them to treat you in a way that would help you. And so God says that's what we're to do. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, in one of the most blistering sermons that our Lord preached, He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. The Lord said they will receive a greater condemnation, specifically because they had devoured widows' houses. In Mark chapter 9, verse 37, we see Jesus say, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Jesus didn't back away from this concept. Even in Matthew 25, in that great scene of what we can call the judgment scene, Jesus said in Matthew 25, <clears throat> talking about the sheep and the goats and all of the things that went on with, with enter into my Father's kingdom, he says to some, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. And in verse 45, he says, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do to the least of these, you did not do for me. He separated the sheep and the goats. And Jesus clearly seems to be saying that he is the widow. He is the orphan and the alien here. Because he says if we did it to the least of these, we did it to him. If we didn't do it to the least of these, then we didn't do it to him. In 1 John chapter 3, John wrote, But whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Well, the obvious implication is that it doesn't. Back to one more in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 22, verse 22, God told the men there that if they mistreated the widows and the orphans, he said to them, your wives will be widows and your children will be orphans. The effect of that is God was saying he was going to give them the death penalty if they didn't pay attention and help provide for those who couldn't provide for themselves. All through God's word, we see this again and again and again, as I say, through all the prophets, through Jesus's ministry, through Acts, through all of the uh, many of the letters in the New Testament. We see little things alluded to that this is an important thing to God. And so it is important for us to provide for those who can't provide for themselves. What would you do if the temperature reached 150 degrees and stayed there? Well, I can tell you what you'd do. Nothing. There's nothing we could do about it. We would all die. What would you do if the temperature went down? to 100 degrees below zero and stayed there. Well, I can tell you again, nothing. There's nothing we could do. We would all die. And my point is this, God supplies that for us. And there are so many things that we cannot, as people, provide for ourselves. As people, we have a temperature range of probably around 120 to 130. That's about all we can stand. If it gets much above that or much below it, we're done. And yet that is what God provides for us every minute of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year of our lives. And that's not to even discuss the other things that God provides for us, such as the air to breathe and all the other things that we can't provide for ourselves. 
And the point is, it is godlike to provide for someone something that they can't provide for themselves. Because that's exactly what God does for us every day. Well, most people are familiar with James 1.27. It's a well-known passage. Religion, pure and undefiled with God the Father, is this. To look after the fatherless and the widows in their tribulation. To keep himself unspotted from the world. James says that that is pure religion. Well, if that's pure religion, then what is the opposite of pure? Impure? Polluted? The obvious conclusion, it seems to me, is that if my religion is one that doesn't include in some way helping to provide for the widows and the fatherless, then it's not very pure. It's not very authentic. And it seems as if when you look at all of the passages in the Bible, that God sort of looks at caring for the widows and the fatherless as a sort of a thermometer that measures our spiritual temperature, maybe even how much we love Him. It measures in that sense, it seems, how spiritually sick we are. And if so, then on a personal level, how is your temperature? How healthy is your spiritual temperature? I think that's something that, that each Christian needs to ask himself on a regular basis and from time to time. Because God continues to provide for us. And he says, this is pure religion. When you provide for those who can't provide for themselves especially again and again and again, he mentions the widows and the orphans. The little guy in your home, or as you sit and worship God, the little guy next to you, or the shy little girl who hides behind her mother's dress, who knows what those children will become? We don't know, but we do know that for us who do know the Lord, it is our responsibility to share God with them as they grow. In 1809, most people were paying attention to Napoleon Bonaparte, who was busy fighting his wars and, and as a matter of fact, that year divorced his wife, Josephine. But there was something that happened out in the middle of almost nowhere. It actually happened in Hardin, Kentucky, and, 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 and nobody even paid any attention. Nobody noticed. It didn't make the headlines. But a baby was born. And there's probably not a person in the world today who has not been affected in some way by that baby that was born in 1809. <clears throat> Tom and Nancy Lincoln had a little baby boy, Abraham, and we all know that he grew to become a remarkable leader in many ways. And there's no doubt the influence that he had. The only question is how much and how long lasting. Well, uh, several years later, a young man was born, Carl was born, and, and he grew up in in Europe, and, and his father came in one day when he was a young boy, and he said, um, he said, uh, Carl, we're going, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to change my name uh, from Herschel to Heinrich. And he said, I'm going to uh, also, we're, we're going to change our church. We're, we're not going to be Jews. We're going to be Methodists. Well, Carl couldn't believe it. What do you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And his father said, basically, if we don't do this, then my business is going to suffer. Well, that bothered Carl greatly. Because, you see, he could see that to his father, his, his religion was something you do. It's not who you are. And so that young boy, Carl, 
was bothered by it and he, and he began to, to, to really act out and, and, and create problems. And he was sent to a school in England, and, but he began to write. And a lot of his ideas were picked up by other people. And he began to write more. And, and at one point he called religion an opiate for the masses. But Carl, like Abraham, had a tremendous amount of influence on a lot of people. Talking about Karl Marx, the father of modern day communism. Karl may not have intended it, but there have been more than 100 million people murdered by their own government under communist regimes. The impact of a child can be great. Children are so important to God. Remember Jeremiah with his writing on the heart? Jeremiah talked about the writing on the heart. Well, Daniel Webster said this, if we work upon marble, it will perish. If we work upon brass, time will efface it. If we rear temples, they will crumble into dust. But if we work upon immortal minds, if we imbue them with principles, with the just fear of God and love of our fellow man, we engrave on these tablets something which will brighten to all eternity. No, we don't know what those little children around us will become, but we do know that it is our job, those of us who know the Lord, to spend time working on the hearts of children. I hope you'll consider these thoughts today and study them for yourself. Thank you very much for watching. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there that people follow. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They follow things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Some attempt to change the order of the turns. Maybe they be, might be baptized before they even believe. Some fail to realize what point they are even on the map. They don't even look at the map, thinking that they're saved already and haven't even opened their Bibles yet. As a person is traveling in a car must follow the road map's directions, or a hiker, as shown here, must follow the trail map, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's consider the first intersection on our road map, believe God's word or to have faith. We must have faith, which comes from God's word, Romans 10, 17. Hebrews 11:6 6 states that we cannot please God without faith. It states, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus stated this, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 8, 24. Our next intersection is repent. Repentance requires a change. We must bring our life in conformity to the way God would have us to be. The Jews who crucified Christ were commanded to repent. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38. Claiming ignorance will not work. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30. Our next intersection is confess. A person must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. To confess this means one acknowledges both his humanity and his divinity. We must confess. As it says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. If you want Jesus to confess you to the Father, then you must confess Jesus before men. Matthew wrote, therefore whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 10.32. The next turn on our map is immersion. Baptism is perhaps the most controversial step in the plan of salvation to some people. However, the New Testament is clear that one has to be immersed in water to obtain salvation. Notice that faith precedes, not negates, baptism. Mark wrote, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Baptism is immersion which pictures a burial. Paul wrote, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
we put Christ on when we are baptized. Galatians 3.27 states, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And some people try to say, well, baptism doesn't save us. But the Bible is very clear about that. Baptism clearly saves us. Quote, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.21 don't let anyone try to persuade you otherwise. Read the New Testament and see it for yourself. Baptism is required to be added to the church, in which is the only place salvation can be found. At this point, we've reached our final intersection on our roadmap, the church. One is not voted into the church after some religious testimony. The Lord adds him to the church. Notice in Acts 2.47, it reads, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Once one is added to the church, they are a Christian. A Christian means like Christ. This means we follow Christ's teaching and example, both in our words and in our deeds. We then must live a Christian life regardless of the consequences. We must remain faithful in the church until the Lord returns and takes his redeemed ones to heaven. We must be faithful Christian regardless of the consequences. Revelation 2.10 states, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Regardless of what Satan throws at us, we must remain faithful to Christ. Regardless of what governments may do to us, we must remain faithful to Christ and his word. We must remain faithful. So in review, let's take one more look at our roadmap to heaven and look at the steps along the way. Number one, believe. Number two, repent. Number three, confess. Number four, immersion or baptism. Number five, add it to the church and remain faithful. Friend, where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. If we can assist you with further information for your journey, please feel free to contact us. Yeah.